Nasser and to the three main foundation for inviting me to come along and speak today about coronavirus, uh, what everyone should uh, know, but dare not ask. Um, as, as you've indicated, I'm basically a full-time GP, so um, just a few disclaimers. Uh, I am a GP, so I'm not an expert on, on coronavirus. Uh, I don't think any of us really are, although there are some people who know more about it than I do. But nonetheless, from a GP perspective, I want to try and share with you the knowledge that we've got at the moment around this and what, what we all need to know about. Um, as I say, it is the best knowledge that I've got today, but it's mainly based on the public information that's out there. I've got some information about some of the other things, but mainly it's the public knowledge that's available. And I've mainly used the World Health Organization, the BBC, and the NHS as my sources for the information out there. And especially in the world of fake news, it's really, really, really critically important that we think about where we're getting our information from and try and make sure that it's as correct as possible. Uh, and it's based on what's publicly known and available until as of today, 7th of March 2020, and that's relevant for the video camera, because if you're watching this film uh, and you're watching it a month from now, then the situation may be very, very different. But as much as possible, I've tried to keep it as up to date as possible. So, we're going to start with a test, and those of you that are here have already seen the letters, I'm just going to ask you a few questions about this and see what your answers are. So does cold weather and snow kill the new coronavirus? Yes or no? No. No? Okay. Does taking a hot bath prevent the new coronavirus? No. No? No? Maybe. No? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe? Okay. No. The one continent, do you, does anyone know the one place, the one place where coronavirus hasn't been identified as yet? Africa. No? They've got it in Africa? South, South America? No. No, they've definitely got it in England. <laughs> anyone? Antarctica? Antarctica, right, Antarctica. So, if taking a hot bath doesn't prevent it, what about cold air? Does cold air prevent it? Yeah. No. No. No? Don't know, okay. Can you get coronavirus by buying products that are being manufactured in China or any other countries that are reporting COVID-19? Yes. No? No. What about hand drying? Does that kill the coronavirus? No. no. How effective are thermal scanners in detecting people that are infected with the coronavirus? Have we been watching on the television? Has people coming off of planes? They're checking if they've got a temperature or not. How effective is that in detecting people that have got coronavirus? Is it? They can have just a normal fever, like. Could be a normal fever. You're right. They could have a normal fever. Yeah. Uh, um, or conversely, they may have. They, they may have a fever. But actually, they've had coronavirus for a lot longer than that, so, so no, it's not, basically. Um, what it does tell you is that people who are ill, but it doesn't tell you whether they've got coronavirus or not. What about spraying alcohol or chlorine all over your body? So we've been hearing about oil, um, um, alcohol sanitizers. If you spray yourself with alcohol, will that kill the, new, the coronavirus? No. No, it won't do. And I'll come back to the answers in a moment. Okay. Um, what about pets at home? Can they spread the new coronavirus? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are saying yeah. yes to that. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. What about vaccines? If you've had a vaccine for pneumococcus um, or for pneumonia, will that protect you against the coronavirus? No, no. No? What about regularly rinsing your nose with saline? Will that help prevent infections of coronavirus? And I've been hearing that if you do your wazoo five times a day, for instance, that that will somehow protect you from coronavirus, will it? No? People say no? What about eating garlic? Garlic is thought to stimulate the immune system. Does eating garlic help you to protect you from coronavirus? Yeah, no. No? Yeah, no. What about, does it just affect older people or are younger people susceptible to it as well? Can the younger people yeah. get it? Yeah. Some people are saying yes? Yeah, no, yeah. Yes or no? Okay. What about antibiotics? If we take antibiotics, will that prevent us from getting coronavirus? No. So people say no. no. And are there any specific medicines that we can take to prevent coronavirus? No, I don't know. So no. some people are not sure about that one. Okay, so those are some of the myths that are out there, some of the questions, and all those questions were on the World Health Organization website. These are clearly issues that people think are, uh, are possible. The answers, well, I'll come back to the answers in a moment. Okay, so let's just start by saying, well, what is the coronavirus? And this, you can't see it very clearly, but this is what the pictures look like. 
This is um, a sort of, if you were to cut through a coronavirus, what it looks like on the side. I'm not going to give you too much more than saying that's what it looks like. But basically, coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that already exist, and they cause a range of illnesses, starting from just the common cold, runny nose, right through to very, very severe diseases, where you can get conditions such as something called acute respiratory distress syndrome, and you can even die from. So, coronaviruses can affect you in very, very many different ways. They're a zoonotic, which basically means they're a virus that started in animals and has jumped over and now affecting human beings. And um, this particular type of virus was identified in December. It's a new virus that has never been seen before, and that's why it was given this new name, COVID-19. Around about a third of all the flu that we have at the moment, that we've always had, is a type of coronavirus, but this particular one, COVID-19, is a new strain that is causing all the difficulties and the cause of what we're talking about. So really what we should do is call it COVID-19 rather than just coronavirus, because it's that particular strain that's causing us all sorts of problems. It first emerged in a place called Wuhan in Hubei province in, in uh, China. And uh, they informed the World Health Organization on the 31st of December that they'd come across some cases of pneumonia that they'd never seen before. So that gives you some idea that for the first time, this was announced to the World Health Organization on the 31st of December, and today, the 7th of March, three months later, and we're now talking about it here. So it gives you some idea of the speed with which this is spread. One of the problems with uh, the coronavirus, or COVID-19, is that you don't know about it until you become symptomatic, until you become poorly. And in fact, it's only the ones who are really poorly, because most people that flu don't go to see the doctor, the man not even go to the pharmacist. So it's the ones who are really quite poorly who then present themselves to general practice, or go to the hospital, or end up on the intensive care. And that's why the only ones that we really know about is the tip of the iceberg. The ones who die, the ones who are very, very severe, and maybe a handful of people who've got a fever and are not feeling quite right. But the majority of people are down here where we know nothing about them. And that's why part of the reason is it's that you, you, once you've been diagnosed with coronavirus, um, you've already had it for perhaps a week, 10 days beforehand that you knew nothing about. Because that's where these are. And this is the challenge that we have at the moment. But if I now forward from the 31st of December when there was a handful of cases and look at where we are now, this is a picture of what's going on globally at the moment. And you can see the dark areas where there's a large concentration of people with coronavirus. So we've got China, Iran, um, Italy, and Japan. But you can see that it's now spread to the other side of the world and is really now in, well, it's in 88 different countries in the world now. I'd say the only place it's not is up in, in, in Antarctica. But this is why this has now hit the press and why everyone is so interested. Because if you look at China, what happened in China, and the chances are what's happened in China may well spread to all the other countries. You can see that on the 21st of, so 31st of December, they announced to the World Health Organization. On the 21st of January, there are 309 cases. And as you start to go from 30th of January, 8th of February, 17th of February, 26th of February, by the 6th of March, they had 80,666 cases. That has happened in three months. And gives you some idea of the speed with which it's spreading and the impact that it's then having throughout the world. But, and this is a really important slide, I think, that although there might be 8,666 cases, actually very few deaths, there's only about 3,000 people that have died. The vast majority um, don't die, they, they, they get poorly, they feel unwell, and I'll come back to how, how poorly they become. We've already got 54,000 people that have recovered from coronavirus and come back to normal. And that's a really, really important message that just because you get coronavirus doesn't mean that you're going to die. Actually, the vast majority of people will survive and go on lead all the virus and things. So let's try and keep this in perspective, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But of course, that was China, and then what happened is, of course, it spread. So in the last three months, it spread, and this is the latest picture from today, well, from yesterday, that the World Health Organization has said. And you can see how it spread from, uh, from, from China, which is over here, uh, to throughout the world. And you can see even in Europe, where it's now spreading um, quite, quite quickly, and perhaps even in the local community. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So, what can we do to try to prevent getting coronavirus? And this is the first thing, is at the moment we're not at the stage where we have it, the majority of people don't have it, but what can we do to try and prevent it? And the first and most important thing is make sure that we are regularly washing our hands. 
doing it properly and for at least 20 seconds. Really very, very important. You can use soap and water, you don't need anything special. You can get alcohol sanitizers and things, but actually soap and water is just as good. And that is the most important measure that we can take. Not garlic, taking garlic or honey or, or uh, washing you know, your, your, your nose and things. But washing your hands regularly is very, very, very important. If you do sneeze, then you'll see I've got a prop here. Make sure you have a tissue with you so that you can take the tissue and then you can, you can blow your nose in the tissue itself. And then, of course, once you've blown your nose, make sure there's a bin that you can throw it in. Okay, so there's my other prop, the bin. That's why it's there. It's very, very important. And I want you to all to think about that now as you're going back when you're in your work environment, when you're in the kitchen. Uh, when the children are watching television, is there a uh, tissue box nearby? Is there a bin that they can throw it in so that it saves it? It doesn't cause um, the, uh, the virus to be in, in the environment for other people to pick up. If you don't have a tissue, then use your elbow and, and just uh, blow your nose like that or cough like that. Again, try and keep it away from places where people are going to touch. Um, Try not to be near somebody who feels unwell because there's the possibility that they may be harboring the COVID-19 uh, the, the COVID or the coronavirus. And then the one that's really, really hard is that for the coronavirus to enter our bodies, we need to touch our eyes or um, uh, touch our face. Okay, so the other thing that we all need to try to do is not touch our eyes and not touch our face. Now when this specialist at the World Health Organization was talking about this, guess what he went and did? He put his hand on his face and they had to point out to him, you're not supposed to do that. In fact, even while I was presenting my thing, I was thinking, what do I need to do? I was putting my hand on my face as well, so this is really difficult. But it's important that we try to not do it and also sometimes we don't notice it ourselves. So if you see somebody else putting your hand on your mouth, <laughs> Try not to do that. <laughs> okay, so what are the symptoms of coronavirus? Well, typically it's a dry cough. So if you're coughing lots of phlegm, that's not likely to be coronavirus. It's a dry cough. Um, you will feel short of breath and you'll have a fever. Those are the typical three symptoms that people have. Sometimes you'll get a headache, sometimes you'll get achy muscles, which is what you often get with the flu anyway. But the main three symptoms are cough, difficulty breathing, and having a temperature. So, how safe is coronavirus, and will I get worse? Now, when I originally did this slide, I said how dangerous, how deadly is coronavirus, and will I get better? But actually, it's the wrong way of thinking about it. What we should think about is coronavirus, for most people, they'll survive. Why? Because for most people, four people out of five, they'll just get mild symptoms. They'll just get, they'll feel fluey, they'll feel achy, uh, they'll have a slight temperature, but they'll get better. And that's the vast majority. Four people out of five, 80% of people. Another 14% of people, just over one in 10, will get much more severe symptoms. And they'll be poorly enough to want to come to the GP surgery, or contact the GP surgery, I should say, rather than come, but contact the GP surgery, or maybe present uh, and, and, and want to present themselves in hospital. And then 6%, 6 out of 100, will become critically ill. Yeah. Second, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so who is at risk of developing coronavirus? Now, this is still a moving target at the moment, but what I'm going to share with you is the two papers that have come out recently. One was with the report that came to the World Health Organization in China. That was published on the 28th of February, just less than a week ago. And it's based on 55,924 laboratory confirmed cases. So these are people who definitely were diagnosed with coronavirus, COVID-19. The other paper came out on the 17th of February, just before that. Now this one was just produced by the Chinese. It wasn't a joint thing. Slightly different. So it had a few more cases, 72,000 but it was based on confirmed, suspected, and those that had no symptoms at all. They were just well, and they, 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 they were diagnosed on it. Um, so slightly more cases, but suspected and say symptomatic. Okay, and what did they find? And this is the findings. First of all, elderly people are much more likely to be at risk than younger people. And here's the data that shows it. So if you were more than 80 years of age, confirmed death was one in five. 
So if you're, what that means is that if you're over 80 and you're diagnosed with COVID-19, then you have a one in five chance of ultimately dying. On the other side of the coin, if you're less than 10 years of age, then there were no fatalities. No children under 10 died based on this, this, the data that came out. Um, and if we look at under 50 years of age, less than 0.4%. That's one person in 200 um, ended up um, dying. And even that, that's all cases. Um, so some of them may not necessarily be definitely proven to be uh, um, coronavirus. 50 to 59, 1.3%, 60 to 69, 3.6%. 70 years and above is 8%. So it gives you some ideas. So the first group of people that are the high risk are those who are elderly. The second is people that have some sort of condition. And if you suffer with cardiovascular disease, so if you suffer with angina or ischemic heart disease, then you had a somewhere between 10 and 13% risk. So slightly over one in 10 people with cardiovascular disease who have coronavirus ended up dying. Diabetes, 7%, 7 till 9. Chronic respiratory problems, so that might be asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, it was somewhere between 6.3 and 8%. If you've got high blood pressure, it's 6 to 8%. If you've got cancer, it's 5.6 to 7.6%. But again, if you don't suffer with any health problems, the chances of you dying are less than 1 in 100. Okay, so those people that have other illnesses are more likely, and particular heart disease and diabetes. And of course, if you've got multiple conditions, then you're more likely to run into problems. Okay, this is not good news for the men in the room, because unfortunately it does seem as though men are more likely to, um, to die than, than women. That's what the data shows, but what that doesn't tell us is that actually Men, and, and remember that this is data from China as opposed to here in Seoul or the rest of the world. But in China, men are much more likely to smoke than females. And so it might well be that the men were dying because they were also smokers. So there's still some um, confusion about whether this is real or not, or whether this has more to do with the fact that the men in China had other pre-existing conditions, or they were already smoking and therefore had damage but hadn't been diagnosed. So I'd take that with a pinch of salt, but at the moment, um, currently, it seems as though men are more likely to, to die than women. And then this is, this is data from yesterday, and this is showing what is going on in the UK, closer to home. And what you can see is that overall, this is from yesterday, 147 cases of um, coronavirus, which they've broken down into regions. And if we look at the northwest, it's 21 at the moment. Now, those numbers are so small at the moment that we can't really say that one area is more dangerous than another, but it gives you some idea of the kind of numbers that we're talking about. In fact, that's 147, which is what they've published on the national website. Um, but if you look at the actual figures, and this is from 7 o'clock this morning, overall, 21,460 people have been tested for it, of which 21,254 have been confirmed not to have COVID-19 but there are 206 people that have been diagnosed with this. And out of, the, out of them, two patients who tested positive have died. Another way of looking at this is out of the 21,000 or 20,000 or so patients, 200, about 1% of those that have been tested. And remember that for you to be tested, someone needed to think that you might be at risk of getting coronavirus. So of those that they thought you might have coronavirus, only 1% actually tested positive. So if you were asked to be tested for it, don't think, oh my gosh, I've got this, because your chance of having it is one in a hundred. And of those 206, only two currently have died. Now, this is a changing picture, but it gives you some idea that at the moment, most people don't have this, and most people should be okay. So the current risk level that the Chief Medical Officer has stated for the UK is that this is a moderate risk. This is not high risk at the moment. That could change, but currently it's moderate. And so therefore they are saying that most people should continue to go to work, to go to school and other, other public places. There is no concern currently that you shouldn't be going to work. But I'm going to come back to that in a moment in terms of what we can do. You only need to stay away from public places if you've been advised by the 111 online corona service, 
or if a medical professional has advised you to um, isolate yourself. Otherwise, you should just continue doing your normal business like you would. Just like today, we are here in this gathering. It's quite safe for us to continue to do that uh, currently, unless you are told otherwise. So, who is at risk? And this is the definition that we've got. This is a bit of a medical definition because that's what we've been given. So I want to share with you what we've been told so at least you understand it. And it says that if you've had contact with somebody who's confirmed to have COVID-19, remember at the moment that's 206 people, or you have returned from a high-risk country, and I'll come back to that in a moment, in the 14 days before you started with your symptoms, and these are the symptoms, that we are looking for. Acute respiratory infection with any degree of shortness of breath or cough. So if you feel short of breath or if you have a cough, whether you have a temperature or not, it doesn't matter. If you are fitting in on those, or you've got a fever but no other symptoms, or you've been diagnosed with a severe respiratory infection that requires an admission into hospital, not to come to the GP surgery, but admission into hospital, with a clinical or radiological diagnosis, radiological being an x-ray that shows that you've got pneumonia or you've been diagnosed with this condition called acute um, respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. They are the group that's at risk. But then what about the contact? So if it's, if it's the contact with someone who's confirmed with it, well, what, what, is it, what, what, what do we mean by contact? Well, the contact is someone who lives in the same household as a person who's been confirmed to have COVID-19, or they've had direct contact with someone who is confirmed to have COVID-19, or their body fluids, and they've not been wearing this personal protective equipment that you've seen on television, I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that. Or they've had face-to-face -face contact with a person with a confirmed infection, or this one, and this is probably the one that's the most important. Being within two meters of a person with a confirmed infection for longer than 15 minutes. So if you walk past somebody who looks a bit unwell, but you've walked past them and you've only been there for seconds, that doesn't suddenly mean, oh my gosh, I might have COVID. You need to have been with that person and you need to have been within sort of two meters of that person for at least 15 minutes to then be able to possibly say that you, and, and that person is then confirmed to have um, um, COVID-19, then you would be considered to be a contact. But just walking past somebody is not considered that. Um, and if you've been there just for five minutes with somebody, again, that's not considered to be a risk. Or if you've been advised by a public health agency that you've had contact with a confirmed case. So those are the contacts. Okay. What about people that are traveling back from other countries? Well, if you've come back from Iran, Hubei province in China, in the lockdown areas in northern Italy, or in the special care zones in South Korea, as soon as you come back to the UK, you have to self-isolate yourself for 14 days, whether you have symptoms or not. It's irrelevant, this is, what you, this is the advice that we've been given at the moment. But, if you've come from some of these areas, so mainland China outside of Hubei province, Italy outside of the lockdown zone, South Korea outside the special zones, Cambodia, Hong Kong, Japan, Laos, Macau, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and you develop symptoms of a cough, high temperature, or shortness of breath in the previous 14 days, then you should then put yourself forward and say, I could be potentially at risk of coronavirus. That's the advice and guidance that we are being advised at this moment in time. Um, my own experience as a GP in, in, in Tameside is that we've had patients come back from Thailand, and we've had patients come back from Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and of course, you may also think about it in terms of in your own families and your communities, which of these places you've been to. Um, and if you've been there, chances are that you know other people that have also been to those places as well. But that's been my experience up till now. Okay, what should you do if you think you have got coronavirus? Well, the first thing, most importantly, is to protect yourself and other people. You must not go to your GP surgery, or go to the pharmacy, or go to the hospital. This is really, really important. Up till now, we've always advised you to feel poorly, go to your GP surgery, go to AD, go to pharmacy. In this situation, if you think you have coronavirus, it's really important that you don't do that. What you should do instead is contact the NHS 11 service. 
And there's a link on the on the website that you can go to on the NHS 111 website. If you go to nhs.uk, you'll see the link to it. You go onto that link. And then it says, if you think you've got coronavirus, you click on that, and it asks you a whole series of questions, which are based on the things that I've just described just now. And based on that, they will then advise you about whether you need to do anything or not. So if you think you, you have coronavirus, or in the last 14 days you've been to one of those countries that I've mentioned, or you've been in close contact with someone whom you know has coronavirus, and you develop symptoms, then you should go to the 111 Corona service. You shouldn't even ring 111. Um, at this moment in time, the advice is not to bring 111, but to go onto the online service if you can. If you don't have the internet, then of course, then bring 111. But the vast majority of the population, 91%, the latest figures show, 91% of the population in the UK is online, is using the internet. So you shouldn't need to ring 111, go to the online service instead. And if they advise you that uh, yes, you are potentially at risk of coronavirus, and you now need to self-isolate, then this is what you need to do. And it starts by saying that you must stay indoors for 14 days and separate yourself from the rest of your family. Okay, so even if your family is also advised to stay in the same house, that doesn't mean we'll all sit together and eat food together and watch television and everything. You need to separate yourself from the rest of the family, but stay within the home itself. You should have um, a bin with your tissues, of course, uh, because, of course, you will have a runny nose and things. But that bin, when you throw the tissues into the bag, in, into, the, into, the, um, in, into the bin, um, it should then be, the, the tissue should then be put into a double bag to try and stop anything from that um, infecting anything else at all. And you do that whilst you're waiting for the tests. Now, in terms of the tests that they're going to do, and different places will do different things, and we're not quite clear about exactly what's going to happen. But they're going to take swabs from your throat and from your nose. The reason I haven't got a picture of how that's going to be is because different areas are going to do it differently. But the important thing is that they're going to swab your nose and your, and, and your mouth. Um, you don't need to provide any urine samples, you don't need to provide any blood tests or anything like that. It's a simple swab inside the mouth and the nose. Um, and, and you will be advised about how to do that by the 111 service. But whilst you're waiting for the results, um, you are expected to stay isolated. Typically, at the moment, it takes about two days for the results to come back, so I think it's 48 hours, um, although they're working on trying to bring that down even quicker than that. Wear a clean mask um, in, a, in the shared kitchen, so if you're the person who's been told that you might have coronavirus, then wear the, uh, the face mask but use separate crockery and cutlery to everybody else. And the other thing that's important is that you go from your room that you're in, you go down to the kitchen, you get the food, you go back into your room and you eat in your own room as much as possible. You try not to touch anything, you try not to cough anywhere else if you can, make sure you've got your tissues with you and things, so that as much as possible, you're keeping the rest of your family away from any risk. Don't invite any visitors to come and visit you, but it's okay for you to ask for people to drop food off for you, uh, knock on the door, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. But don't invite them and sit down for hours and hours because you're putting them at risk as a consequence of that. Use a separate bathroom if possible, or clean shared, uh, or clean shared bathroom regularly and use separate towels. And again, what they're advising is that um, if the family is going to go to the toilet, for instance, in the morning, that everybody else should go first, and the person with coronavirus should go last and spend the least amount of time in the bathroom as possible, because that's a high-risk place where it could spread to other people. So that's what self-isolation is about. And that would happen for two weeks. Okay, some people are worried about payments, what happens to your earnings if suddenly you are told that you have to um, self-isolate. So um, I'm not an expert on this, but I want to give some idea of what the situation is at the moment. So the government currently is saying that employers should pay sick pay for those who've been asked to self-isolate. So if you are an employee, then your employer should be expected to pay you while you're off for those two weeks. There is statutory sick pay for employees, which is £94.25 a week. That normally kicks in after you've been off for three days. 
the government currently is looking at changing legislation so that that starts immediately and you don't wait three days for it, so that there's as little hardship to you as possible. Those people that are on zero hours contracts can still get um, sick pay, and that's the official line what the government is saying. Put them at short notice, your employer must give you time off to do that. It's not a question of the employer saying you can't do this. They have to do that, and this is again, this is what's coming from the official uh, government. However, unfortunately, you probably won't get paid for it whilst you're off, unless it says so in your contract. So again, have a look at your contract to see what happens. If you're asked because you're caring for your family or somebody else. But you might be able to work from home. And I'm going to come back to some of the things that you can do at the moment so that you can still be functioning whilst you're staying in your own home environment. Okay. So, what should you expect from your GP surgery? Um, well, the first thing is that you should expect your GP surgery to remain open and accessible. In other words, business as usual. That's what should happen. We've had a few cases around the country where people have walked into a GP surgery and said, I think I've got coronavirus. That's been a disaster. Because as a result of that, they've had to close down the whole surgery and then they've had to deep clean it, which clearly has an impact on everybody else. We're really hoping that people don't do that. So, if you want to keep your surgery open and accessible, don't go to your GP surgery if you think you've got coronavirus. Your GP surgery should have already put up posters on the walls or even on the windows outside the door. So, if you, come, if you go to your GP surgery now, even though it might be closed, you may well see posters up there telling you what to do, but actually it could be the information that I've provided here for you. Some of you may well have received text messages from your GP surgery telling you what to do. Have a look on the practice website, and there may also be warning notices if you're going online to book your appointment to tell you what to do. So this is something that you know all GP surgeries have been advised to do, and hopefully you've already received all that. I'm now going to show you a few things that practices are doing now as we speak, and even over the weekend my WhatsApp has been really, really busy as practices are starting to turn things around. And one of the things that they're now offering, some of them, are online medical consultations where you can go online and you can put your symptoms in, whatever the symptoms are, whatever the problems, not just the coronavirus, so that you can provide information for the practice and the practice can get back in touch with you. They're offering telephone consultations, so rather than you having to see the, the doctor or the nurse, they're speaking to you on the phone. And of course, remember that the risk isn't just for the doctors, but also for yourselves. Do you really want to walk into a GP surgery, sat with somebody who's coughing and spluttering, and they don't yet know that they've got coronavirus. So I'm sure from your point of view as well, you would also prefer to talk to someone on the phone rather than going in. Some of us are now introducing video consultations, which is like a Skype call or a FaceTime call, so that if you need to see the doctor or nurse, or if the doctor or nurse needs to see you, then we'll be able to use video consultations to do that. And again, there's been lots of activity this weekend with lots of practices asking how to do it, because again, you may well not have had this up till now, but we are going to have to turn things around and maybe even switch this on um, uh, almost instantly. And to give you some idea, before I, this afternoon, as I was preparing this talk, I was talking to my partners and said, listen, we need to switch video consultations on, and we actually had a go at practicing with each other and video consulting with each other, just to see how it's like. So it gives you some idea of how things are changing very rapidly. Of course, we now know how to do it. We're now going to need to communicate that to all our patients to say, if you've got a smartphone, can, you, can, can we video consult you rather than having to see you in person? Um, we've now been advised to stop all online booking of face-to-face -face consultations. So lots of GP practices around the country have allowed you to go online to book an appointment so that you can then just turn up at the surgery. We've now been advised to stop that because it would be highly dangerous. Um, and the reason for that is because you'll then just turn up without any doctor or nurse having a look at what you're doing. So those of you that have been able to book appointments online face to face, you'll find that you won't be able to do that anymore. For, and it's for your safety as well as ours. Uh, what we've also done is sometimes practices can allow you to book an appointment in advance a week from now to be seen by the doctor of your choice. Again. We personally in our practice have now stopped this, and again that was a decision we made this weekend, and you may well find other practices do the same as well. So that the options will be telephone consultations, video, online medical consultations. Okay, what else is going to happen? When you ring up the surgery and you say, I'm not feeling very well, 
The receptionist may well ask you these three questions. Firstly, do you have a high temperature, a cough, or are you feeling breathless? Secondly, have you been in close contact with someone who has been proven to have coronavirus? And thirdly, have you been to any of these following areas in the last two weeks? These are the high risk places, and these are the risks, these are the areas where we know that there's a lot more coronavirus going on. And this will become and should become standard questions that receptionists will automatically ask you uh, when you ring up the surgery. So don't be surprised if this happens. If you are deemed at risk and you've come to the GP surgery, because some people will end up doing that, if you arrive, remember we've got 15 minutes and that two metre distance. So if you arrive at the GP surgery, and we really don't want you to do that, but if you do do that, you will be asked to return back to your home immediately and phone 111. At this moment in time, you're not being advised to take a face mask or anything like that, but clearly it's very, very important uh, that you, uh, you get back home. It's advised that you don't use public transport, so don't go on a bus, don't, don't call Uber or a taxi and say, can you take me back to my home again? Because you're then gonna infect that, that taxi, that bus, and that will cause problems. So you'll be advised to go straight back to that. So there's no point coming to the GP surgery because you'll only be told immediately to go straight back home again. And you'll be advised to, uh, or, sorry, or, if you are really quite poorly and you can't go back home, then you will be advised to go into what we call an isolation room. And every GP surgery will have a designated isolation room. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute in terms of what that involves. If you're in the consulting rooms, if you were sat with me and say, hello, what can I do for you? And you go, well, I've got a cough, I've got breathlessness, uh, and I've got a fever, and I've just come back from Iran, or I've just come back from Thailand, then what I will do immediately is get up and walk out of the room and close the door behind me, okay? Again, please do not be surprised if a clinician does that. They are doing that for your protection as well as ours. And we will leave you in that room with the door closed. And then we will phone you so that we'll explain what has happened. We will leave the room first and phone you back to explain what's going on and what will happen next. And what will happen next is that we will then contact Public Health England and advise them about what's happened. And then they will then advise us in terms of what to do and how to get you out of that room into somewhere else. That's going to seem very, very strange when a clinician just immediately gets up, doesn't argue with you. That is what we are being advised to do. Okay, so what happens in this isolation room in the GP surgery when you're suddenly left on your own? Well, the door is shut. We advise you to open the window in that room so whatever is can get out. Um, we advise you to sit in the chair. Um, and wait for the phone to ring because we'll phone you to explain what's going on. And then if there's tissues there, then again, use the tissue and use the bin uh, to clear, clear everything. And that's going to become the isolation room where that person is there until that person has been removed. And then once they've been removed, that room itself will be deep cleaned to make sure it's safe for anyone else to use. Okay. We've been given advice in terms of what kind of room it should be. It should be a room that doesn't have carpet in it because it's much harder to disinfect a room with a carpet. A lot of GP surgeries have changed and got rid of carpets as a result of advice that we've had previously. Uh, and uh, so, so that, disin that isolation room should be something that is relatively easy to disinfect, but that's the plan. And then, and again, don't be surprised, but this is how your doctor or nurse, if they're gonna come back and see you, are gonna look. And they're going to have a face mask, um, they're going to have an apron, and they will have gloves. And at this moment in time, every single GP surgery is having these things sent to us so that we are ready to deal with whatever comes through the door. It may look quite scary when you're seeing your doctor or your nurse in that sort of garb, but again, we are doing that to keep you safe and keep ourselves safe as well. Okay, so that's what GP surgeries across the board are doing. Um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't describe what I'm doing in my own practice. So I just want to share with you the things that we're doing in our practice. And you'll see very clearly that this is not about me selling what I'm doing. And I'm not promoting any particular product, but I'm just describing what we're doing. 
So we invited and encouraged all our patients to have full access to the GP electronic health record. We've been doing that for 15 years now. So that electronic record that we use, we've enabled our patients to be able to read, read everything, all the information using their smartphone. Um, and there's a picture of one, and you can see the consultation that they can then use, and they can access that from anywhere, anywhere they are. So imagine if you're self-isolated and you're sat in your own house, you can see the same information as what we can. You can book appointments online, um, and as I say, we've switched off the face-to-face -face appointment booking, but you can book appointments for telephone consultations, um, and many of you may well already have apps. In fact, just here in this room, how many of you have got an app that allows you to book an appointment online with your GP surgery? Anybody? Okay, so out of a room of about 40 people, we've at the moment currently got three people that can do that. Actually, it's part of the GP contract. Every GP surgery has to enable you to be able to book appointments and order repeat prescriptions online. So I would encourage you all to contact your GP surgery, but go onto the practice website rather than ringing them on Monday morning because that will cause lots of problems. But go onto the website and look at information that tells you about how you can download an app um, your PIN numbers can be emailed over to you so that you can then install it and then be able to access uh, at least order prescriptions and book appointments online as well. And those practices that are giving full access, um, the full thing. And then the other thing that we've implemented is something called Engage Consult, where it asks you a whole series of questions about whatever problem you have and provides us with a very detailed medical history. Um, we currently are the only practice that I'm aware of in Greater Manchester that's got that particular solution. But there are other solutions that other people are using for triaging purposes where you can send a medical information electronically into the practice and the practice will then try and deal with it. We've got our practice website and this is, this is our practice website um, uh, which has on the top of it all the information about what to do with coronavirus. Again, your practice website should also provide information on there. We've gone a little bit further than what the, the national guidance says including things like how to self-isolate, which is what this video is actually a video that BBC have produced, but it's a great little video that explains things, and what the current situation is, what's going on. So we are providing information about what's happening to our patient population in Hyde and in Horse and Grief, um, because actually we feel that patients want to know what's going on locally and not just what's happening nationally. Um, and then we've been sending text messages to patients. So how many here receive a text message from their GP surgery to say if you have coronavirus? So again, out of about 40 people, we've got about five at the moment that receive a text message. That's useful for me because I will go out and send a message to all my GP colleagues to say you should send text messages out to everyone to know what to do about it. Um, We've just um, introduced something new that we're just about to start, which is an app that allows us to send a specific message to um, the patient, and then they can see videos and photographs. It's very, very new. It's not readily available at the moment. But we've done that, and I mentioned Engage Consult, which is um, a website that you can use on your smartphone that allows you to send medical histories in. Okay, so let's do the test again. Does cold weather and snow kill the kill the, uh, the new coronavirus? Yes or no? No. Does taking a hot bath prevent the new coronavirus? No. No. Does Antarctica, if we go to the cold weather, does that kill the coronavirus? Yes. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make any difference at all. The reason it doesn't make any difference is whether it's hot or cold, our bodies are designed to stay at a temperature of between 36.5 and 37 degrees centigrade. So it really doesn't matter whether you're in a very hot climate or in a cold climate. Our temperatures are the same, and because the virus doesn't live outside, I think it only lasts about seven or eight hours, it lives inside our bodies, and because our bodies are the same temperature wherever you are, it makes no difference. The only reason it's not got to Antarctica is because we aren't going to Antarctica. If we were going there, I'm sure it would have arrived there as well. Okay, can you get coronavirus by buying goods? manufactured in China or any other country that's reporting COVID-19? No. no. Are hand dryers effective in killing the new coronavirus? No. No. Why? Why are hand dryers not effective? Do you know? They dry hands. They dry hands? You're quite right. Well done. Good answer. Because where does the coronavirus live? Inside. Inside our bodies. Exactly. So washing your hands will get rid of it. Inside your body. Sorry? The hair dryer can't get inside. Exactly, so that's why hair drying won't clear it. You're quite right. What about thermal scanners? 
Are they good at in, in detecting people that are infected? And we said, no, they're not, because all they detect is that you've got a temperature. And remember that you may well have the coronavirus for up to 14 days before you start with your temperature. Does spraying alcohol or chlorine all over your body affect, um, kill the coronavirus? No, it doesn't, because it's inside your body. It's not on the surface. And in fact, it could actually cause you more problems if you start spraying alcohol uh, or chlorine on your body. You can get allergic reactions. It can affect your skin and everything else. So please don't do that. Can pets at home spread the new coronavirus? Yes. No, they can't. It's not spread by pets. How is it spread? Nope. By that too. <coughs> how's it spread? Yes. Yep, and how do humans spread it? <coughs> close contact. Sorry? Yeah. Close contact. Yeah, yeah. How is the close contact? <coughs> coughing and sneezing. Droplets. That's what causes it. Okay, so it's coughing and sneezing that causes it, not animals, not anything else. It's not in the air. Um, do vaccines stop us from getting coronavirus? No, they don't. Our 80-year-olds, all of them get vaccines, and yet they're the ones who are dying. So we know that vaccines don't currently. We are developing vaccines, but they think it's going to take about 18 months before we have a vaccine against this. We need something now, as you can, as, as you can see with the pictures of what's happened in China. Uh, what about rinsing your nose? Doing with them? No? Doesn't do that either? Eating garlic? No. Yeah. Nope. Garlic doesn't work either, I'm afraid. What does work? Because it protects your immune system more. What, what does work, though? Because the garlic, the garlic bread helps your immune system. Don't you brush your... Do you want to check it? Yeah, blow your nose. Yep, yeah, throw it in the bin. Well done, everyone. <laughs> That's what works. Okay, let's remember that. Okay. Does it only affect older people? Yeah, no, it affects older people, yeah, but it doesn't only affect them. It affects everybody, okay? Um, even, even though that we haven't had any deaths in anyone under 10, we do have children who have been diagnosed with coronavirus, so it can affect everybody. And are antibiotics effective against it? No, no they're not. Antibiotics only work with bacterial infections, this is viral. Antibiotics do not work. And are there any specific medicines to prevent or treat the new coronavirus? No. We do not have any medicines currently that can treat it. There is talk about certain treatments out there that people are using, and I've seen messages on WhatsApp, but that's not proven at this moment in time, and a lot of very clever people are still working on this to try. At this moment in time, there are no medicines available for treating it. Um, so, what else can you do now? Well, the first thing is, let's be calm, let's not panic, but be prepared for what's likely to come. And that means that I want you all, those of you in this room and those of you that are watching the video as we speak, to start thinking about if tomorrow you are asked to be self-isolated for two weeks, what are you going to do? That's the conversation I was having with my wife this afternoon, around if we suddenly had to stay in the house for two weeks, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Which room are we going to stay in? And that sort of thing. Have we got uh, food in the house? And those sorts of things. But remember, your food can come in, and the government has also confirmed that no one is going to get into trouble. They will make sure food will arrive uh, with you. But nonetheless, start thinking now about what you might do. Think about whether you could work from home. Um, on Monday, I'm not going to go into my GP surgery. I'm going to stay at home and I'm going to deal with my calls on Monday um, over the telephone. It's a bit of a practice run, but it's just to see how things are. Now, we've got systems in our practice that allows us to do that. But again, we're doing that because if one in five of us is going to get coronavirus, and that's what the experts are saying, and there's 40 people in this room, which means that eight of us, and we don't know which eight they are, are going to be self-isolated for two weeks. If it's you, what are you going to do? Can you still work? Are there things that you can do now? Do you need to go and buy things that could keep you in the home that would allow you to do that? So one of the things that we were talking about, my partners, this afternoon, was about whether we need to buy um, webcams so that we can communicate with patients using video technology. Um, and we're thinking about buying it now and having it in the surgery so that we can then do video consultations. 
We've not needed to up till now, but we're thinking about it. Uh, smartphones can allow you to video console immediately, uh, and so we don't actually need to buy that ourselves. And you, got, you don't need to buy it either, by the way. If you've got a smartphone, that's all that's needed. So you won't need it either. Um, but for us, if we're using a smartphone, it slows us down if we've got to type on the computer, so actually having a webcam may, may be, make things easier. But that's just an example of the kind of conversations that we are now having about how to prepare for this. Think about cancelling or postponing meetings. I was due to present, ironically, about coronavirus over in Paris in two weeks' time uh, at an international conference. Um, I've actually had to cancel that uh, because it's not necessary. You know, in, in the world of technology today, where you can record this and watch the video later, why do you need to fly off somewhere? So if you don't need to go to that meeting, if it can be done electronically, that's much, much safer than you trying to go to meetings just because you have to start thinking about what's in your diary now and say, do I need that or do I cancel it? Wash your hands frequently with, salt, with, with water and soap or a sanitizer uh, and catch your coughs and sneezes in a tissue. Practice it. Go home today and say to everyone, if you cough, what are you going to do? If you sneeze, what are you going to do? Get everyone to have a go so if you practice and practice and practice, it will become normal for you so you'll know what to do when you need to do that. And keep telling everyone about that. Make sure you know how to use the online services. If you are someone who's on medication, you need that medication, download the app. If you don't know how to download the app, ask somebody, get in touch with somebody. If you still don't know, contact me. I'm happy to try and help you or point you in the right direction. We've got all sorts of information to help you. But do that now whilst you can. Don't wait until you're stuck and then think, how do I get my medication? And not only say, oh, I've got it, but make sure it's working. Log on today and check. And if it's not working, go and contact your practice. Maybe not first thing on Monday morning because they're going to get very, very stretched, but perhaps later in the day, you contact the practice and say, how do I get my PIN numbers? What do I need to do? What's the app? Ask your children, ask your grandchildren if you're not very good on the IT. They'll be able to help you. And we've got a number of IT specialists in the room today, maybe in that discussion we can talk about what we can do to try and make sure that everybody knows somebody who can help. I mentioned a temperature is one of the symptoms. But it's amazing how many people don't have a thermometer. So in this room, how many people have a thermometer in that at home? Okay, so in this room, I would say that something like two-thirds of the adults, we'll keep the children out for a minute, but two-thirds of the adults have a thermometer. That still leaves a third of us who don't, and that's in this room. So if you haven't got a thermometer, please go out and buy one, because that will be very helpful for you. Keep paracetamol and ibuprofen in your home, if, if, if you can, and other over-the-counter uh, over, um, over remedies. Um, coronavirus is coming, it's going to affect you in by causing you to have sneezing and coughing and things, temperatures. Take paracetamol and ibuprofen. I'm aware that some of the pharmacies are now starting to run out of this medication, of, 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 of paracetamol and ibuprofen. It may cause difficulties, so don't panic if you can't get hold of it. But if you can, make sure you know where it is, and make sure everyone in the family knows where it is as well. Use health services wisely. We are under fantastic pressure at the moment. 111 is working as hard as it can. GP surgeries are, community services are, pharmacies are, hospitals are. We already knew that before coronavirus. This is going to put even more pressure on an incredibly strained um, um, service. So it's really important as much as possible that you do things that you can do rather than trying to contact the health services and asking them. Stay up to date with what's going on. Look at what the latest information is. The BBC is regularly putting out information out there for you to know about. The newspapers are. Um, there are trusted websites, including NHS Choices, which is www.nhs.uk, um, and the government websites. Those are three good places that you can look at. And then, as I've indicated, our practice website is a good source of information that you can go to. I'm the Neighbourhood Watch coordinator for our street, and we've got about 20 or so families, some of whom have young children and some of them are quite elderly. If you think about one in five of us is going to get coronavirus, that means there'll be four families on our street who could potentially end up being self-isolated. Now, we've already organised ourselves into our own little WhatsApp group, that was really about burglaries. That's what Neighbourhood Watch came, came about for, uh, to, to try and protect ourselves and save ourselves and, and learn about how we can make our homes safe and secure. Well, what about coronavirus? 
And if you know that you've got an elderly person, just being able to say, are you okay, can we help you? And if someone is self-isolated, you might want to just contact them and say, have you got food, do you need anything, I'm popping over to the shops, I can bring things back to you. Let's become more enabled and support each other rather than living in isolation. And then share the video. Hopefully this presentation that we've done today has been helpful for you. Share that with all your friends and so everybody else can learn as well and find out what to do for themselves. So what I want you to think about is this video is going to be out hopefully later tonight, I'm told. Think about the three people in your contact list that you can send that video to. So when we send that video to you, you send it to those three people and tell them to send it to three other people. Let's get the information out there as much as possible. Because remember that we can beat this and the way we'll do it is do it together. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah.